All right, welcome everybody to our 2021 session of the Sussex County Community College College Novel Lecture Series. I'm Mary Thompson. I'm a professor of English here at Sussex County Community College, and I'm also the College Novel Coordinator. And this year, as you know, we are talking about Andy Weir's The Martian. And I am so very pleased that today we have Dr. Megan Vermeulen joining us from the Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine down in Southern Jersey. So welcome, Dr. Vermeulen. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I am super excited to be joining you and saying hi to everybody at Sussex County Community College. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate you dedicating your time, especially as we all know, the reason we're doing this on the screen instead of in the front of our auditorium is because we're in a global pandemic. So I know the medical doctors are especially busy. <laughs> and I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. So before we My get pleasure. started, I wanted to go through your bio, if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay. So for all of you watching this lecture, uh, Megan Vermeulen graduated with her BS in biology, um, a concentration in molecular genetics, and enough credits to minor in English, if she chose, from King's College in 1995, after which she obtained her medical degree from MCP Hahnemann, which is now Drexel College of Medicine. She completed a residency in family medicine from Virtua Health in New Jersey in 2002 and was named a fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians in 2019. For the last five years, she's been an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine, part of Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey. She recently created and successfully accredited a novel family medicine residency program for Inspira Medical Center, Molika Hill, becoming their founding program director in October 2020. She's also been named medical director for the Rowan Family Medicine Office in the new Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine, Sewell Branch Campus, slated to open March 1st. Academically, she has studied and published on the concepts of grit, resilience, and the importance of physician and residence wellness. And for these reasons, um, and because she has such vast expertise, we asked her to join us here to give her insights into Andy Weir's The Martian. So welcome again, Dr. Vermeulen. We are so happy to have you with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. I think I sound great on paper, so I hope I live up to like all those any words that we just talked about. I and, am uh, sure I'm you're even excited. better face to face like this. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm really excited uh, to be with you guys, and um, you know, it's a real pleasure to talk about you know grit and resilience and wellness, especially in light of the fact that we, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, we are currently living in a global pandemic. Um, and this is something I've had a long-standing interest in, both academically and professionally. So it's a great opportunity to marry literature and fiction um, with the real world that we've all been living with in the last year. So thank you, Dr. Thompson. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you for that lovely segue, because as we all know, as I said, I'm a professor of English. So I talk about the importance of literature all the time, but mm -hmm. obviously I'm biased. Um, I do think we should be reading and we should be reading as much as possible and especially in the realm of fiction. But this is the question I wanted to pose to you as someone outside mm -hmm. of the field of literature. Why should we read fiction? It's often thought as, you know, just something that we use to pass the time. Maybe some of us have been reading more during the pandemic, but usually we just read when we want to kill time, when we're sitting in an airport. So why might fiction have real value in all disciplines, including STEM fields, such as medicine? Absolutely, Absolutely. it's a great question. I, for me personally and professionally, um, even when I'm talking with my learners, um, fiction is a real mirror onto ourselves. It shows us things that we may otherwise avoid talking about openly or that consciously we actually think about or we feel uncomfortable discussing. And generally speaking with humans, whether we're talking about um, an intellectual concept or an emotional concept, or just like making uh, dinner a different way or adhering to a different diet or starting an exercise program, we avoid discomfort at all costs. We will go to great lengths to avoid things that are new. And fiction is kind of a safe way to explore new things. Um, whether you go into a new concept, whether you're watching a new series or reading a new novel, 
you don't necessarily go in with that, the intention of thinking, I'm going to learn something new about myself. But the fact that you're opening yourself up to different worlds, to different experiences, you know, you wind up learning from everything that you read, from everything you come into contact with. And it will give you those like aha moments um, that you really prompt yourself to say, gosh, I never thought about this, or I experienced this in my own life. And it really does help pave the way for meaningful change. I use fiction quite a bit when I counsel my patients on changing habits and um, developing new ways of taking care of themselves. So it really is, you know, I, I would say the esoteric or the um, the fancier way of saying fiction is that mirror that we use in ourselves. And the reality of it is, it's just a way of learning new things. It's a learning new things about ourselves and about the community that we live in. That's fantastic. So as a medical professional, and if we turn our talk specifically to Andy Weir's book, mm -hmm. what do you find to be most of interest in The Martian? You said, you know, you talk about fiction with your patients. Um, what should we be talking about today when we're studying The Martian at Sussex County? Great question. Um, you know, I think for me, you know, when Dr. Thompson approached me with this concept, it really is twofold. One is the obvious, right, which is social, social isolation and the global pandemic. And I can remember when we really started talking about social distancing, we tried very hard to use the terms with our learners of physical distancing versus social distancing, which is something we're going to talk about, I think, a little later. Um, so there's an obvious parallel um, with us all being isolated and living on Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams or whatever venue you're using. The second is the concepts of grit and resilience and the importance of self-care. And these are concepts that have been around for a long time in the medical literature. There's something that gets talked about by psychology and social work and all kinds of different fields, but they've been really highlighted in the last year for all of us. It doesn't matter what discipline you're in. It doesn't matter if you're law enforcement or you're a grocery store clerk or you're working at Amazon packaging, um, you know, things to go out on Prime and that, you know, shipping, you know, self-care has really come to the forefront of what we do every day. So that point is intimately tied to the concept of social isolation that we've all experienced in the global pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I really think that the Martian's a good mirror for that, showing that this is somebody who's in extraordinary circumstances that he never anticipated. We're all living that, right? How often have we heard the phrase, this is, um, you know, this is a new experience, this is unanticipated, this is um, something new that we've all, or a novel experience that we've all had. Unprecedented times is one of those cliches that gets thrown around a lot. And yes, he was living in an unprecedented, unexpected new experience and had to really dig deep with that core of grit and resilience and self-care, not only to survive it, but to thrive in that environment too. That's so true. Um, and I love that when we open the novel, his very first sentence begins with an expletive when he tells us exactly oh, yeah. <laughs> how isolated he's feeling. And I think many of us are feeling um, some of the same things, obviously to a lesser degree. We're not on our own. I would agree. But yeah. it feels kind of the same. So we are all experiencing this isolation to um, varying degrees, although technology such as the one we're using right now is definitely mm -hmm. helping bridge the gap somewhat. So how do you think isolation is playing a role in the Martian? And what do you see as particularly true to life, especially in the reactions that Mark Watney is having mm -hmm. to the situation? I, I, you know, it's interesting. I really reflected on this question quite a bit. And we, as Dr. Thompson pointed out, we're all experiencing this. We're all experiencing a form of physical distancing or social isolation, whatever term you want to apply to it. And Watney is technically isolated because obviously he's on Mars, right? Like he's not on Earth. Um, he's not really close by. It's not like he's in, you know, New Jersey and his family's in Philadelphia. Um, so he's able to make contact eventually, right? Like through email and electronic communication with NASA and with his family. And how he uses technology, I find is very parallel to how we just abruptly shifted our life, both in terms of workflow and family communications. Um, the practice that I'm part of, um, Rowan Family Medicine, which is part of Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine in Rowan Glassboro, we turned to telemedicine in 48 hours. Wow. I've never seen a workflow shift. I, 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 I thought my head was going to actually spin off. It, I've never seen a workflow shift that dramatically. We went from maybe a little bit of telemedicine to, and the majority of our patients were still in person, to 100% telemedicine, literally 48 hours, boom, we're all telemedicine. And 
it was a dramatic shift for us. And I think that his reactions and the use of technology really parallel that shift that we had. Like he clearly, yes, he probably anticipated he was going to have to use it for a while. He was going to Mars. Again, he was not going next door. He knew this was going to be a short-term form of communication with NASA. He knew that's how he was going to communicate with his family. He obviously did not anticipate that this was going to stretch and last. And I think when we first went into shelter at home, when we first engaged the pandemic, we thought, okay, like we can do this for a couple months, you know, it'll be okay. It's a year. <laughs> we're we're clock ticking, you know, we're kind of out of here and we're all living in Zoom. So I think that anticipatory anxiety maybe also paralleled. The one thing that they didn't talk about a lot um, when you look at the Martian is that role of physical contact and that concept of the true physical distancing. Social distancing really means that you are isolated. You are not talking to other people. You know, you're in a remote location where you don't have this connection. And that is a very real thing that a lot of my patients are dealing with. I have patients who live in relatively remote areas and they don't have Wi-Fi connection. Um, for me to do a telehealth visit, they've got to have a family member that has really good Wi-Fi or hotspot on their phone, or they've got to go to a family member's house that has a hotspot that they can engage in this. And those patients are really struggling because it may be weeks before they see another human. All of us are dealing with physical isolation, meaning we're not seeing people other than maybe the people we're living with and our pets. We're not seeing them physically face to face. And when you look at how humans deal with affection, what we need to feel valued and loved, some people legitimately need that physical contact. Um, there's a great book for um, interpersonal relationships called The Five Love Languages. There's actually a leadership development book called The Five Love Languages in the Workplace. We actually, true story, even though we're family medicine department, we have a faculty book club. So I'm going to get my plug in for reading. And um, We have a faculty book club. And one of the books that we read probably about 18 months ago was The Five Love Languages in the Workplace. And we actually talked about the concept of physical touch in the workplace, which is kind of a taboo subject, right? You know, like, oh, is it going to be inappropriate? Or is somebody going to think that I'm doing something wrong or I'm making a sexual advance or whatever? And the reality of it is there are acceptable forms of touch in a workplace that some people really need and it makes a difference for them and their validation just like they need that physical touch in a close setting it doesn't have to be intimate or romantic it can just be a friend giving somebody a fist bump or getting a hug from someone that you haven't seen in a long time mm -hmm. and those forms of love or affection or validation are crucial to who we are as people there's innumerable studies done looking at babies that are raised without touch you know, that's why when you talk about a baby who's born, that skin-to-skin -skin contact, right? Um, volunteers should go to the nursery to rock babies, to hold them. For parents or mothers who have died who don't, or who are orphaned and abandoned, they need that physical touch. And that's not something that explored a lot, but I think it is something we need to keep in mind with what we're dealing with right now with the pandemic. That's really fascinating because obviously that's not something that Watney has and at the end of the book yeah. when he is reeled in to yeah. um, and joins the rest of his crew he bursts into tears for the first time uh, yeah. since the, the whole experience and it's probably yeah. because of that uh, yeah. experiencing that touch and that physical connection yes. after such a long period of isolation. Yeah, I was actually reading a fiction novel. Um, it's one of my the fiction writers that I really like. And one of the characters had been undercover for a really long time, mm -hmm. had been undercover for like three or four years. And um, when he came out from being undercover, you know, he said to this new partner, like, I'm going to need touch for a long time. I'm just going to need wow. somebody to touch me, mm -hmm. whether it's a handshake or a pat on the back or a hug. Um, we're extraordinarily social creatures. You know, we are at the top of the food chain in terms of our ability to socialize and touch and physical contact is absolutely a key part of that. Wow. Um, another thing that I find really interesting and that kind of ties in with this, it's not just um, the isolation, I think that's weighing on mm -hmm. people, but we're, we're all doing so many new things. And Mark Watney deals with <laughs> failure. <laughs> many times very yeah. humorously oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the novel and setbacks um and one entry here um it says he, he did his uh, his first expedition it says serious one is complete 
More accurately, Sirius 1 was aborted after one hour. I guess you could call it a failure, but I prefer the term learning experience. Um, so why is this perspective so important in both his survival and in what college students and really everyone can learn at this particular moment in history? I think that that's a great quote and um, for a number of reasons. One, there is that old cliche that we use in education that we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes, right? Um, and that cliche exists for a reason. And we're not just saying that to have our learners feel better, right? We're not just saying that to our kids so they feel better about you know, bombing a test or falling off their bike for the first time when they learn how to ride it. Um, we're saying that because it's, it's a true story. We actually do learn a lot from that. You know, one of my uh, quarantine projects, and I had a couple of them, like my accreditation application with my quarantine project, right? Um, I started listening to podcasts, which I just had never really had the time or the opportunity to do before. So I started listening to Brene Brown's Unlocking Us, which was the top podcast on, on a Spotify and the top podcast launched on Apple in 2020. And she is a research, research psychologist. She's a degree in social work. And she's one of the leading authorities on vulnerability and leadership. She's done a 10 year study looking specifically at leadership and vulnerability. Really talks about shame. She's got a TED talk, like she's kind of the guru on this. And her podcast dropped the day that Shelter at Home happened. Like you want to start a new venture and you've got it. She said she's got this brand new studio and she's got the sound equipment and she put all this effort into like what the music was going to be. And now she's isolated, literally. And I actually printed this out and then I wrote it down on a post-it note and put it next to my computer to look at. And she talked about uh, what are called Bernay on FFTs uh, or effing first times. And the fact that we are all dealing with so many new workflows and so many changes every day. Um, and those coping tools were really to look at and say, um, normalize it, say out loud, this is the first time I've been stranded on Mars without a team, right? Like I think you right. he want to be saying this, right? Like, I, think he, I think he does at some point. He's he does, supposed right? to come in those exact words. Yes. Yes. This is my first time stranded on Mars. This mm -hmm. is my first global pandemic. Right. Okay. Um, you know, so we're going to normalize it and just call it what it is. Um, you know, we're going to, um, you know, really say to ourselves, we're going to put this in perspective. It's not, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to be stuck on Mars forever. We don't think right now, although we're at a year, we're going to be stuck in this global pandemic forever. Um, and then reality check your expectations, mm -hmm. you know, and really say to yourself, um, I'm doing the best I can with what I have. Any good therapist will tell you, you're going to do the best you can with what you have. And tomorrow's going to take care of itself. And I, if I worry about it obsessively, I'm not actually creating anything fruitful out of that. I'm boxing with shadows. I'm wasting energy. Um, it, she revisited this concept when season two of her podcast dropped in the fall. And she added to that the importance of um, engaging in self-care. You know, she added to that the importance of normalize it, put it in perspective, reality check your expectations, take a pause for yourself refill your cup back up and really look at what am I doing to continue to take care of myself while I'm doing those first three things on a daily basis. And it's great. That's a wonderful segue that you bring up self-care because one of the things that I like to tell my students when we're studying literature, especially mm -hmm. early American literature, is we're a country founded by Puritans. Um, and we have that yeah. work ethic, mm -hmm. whether we realize it or not, ingrained in us and we tend to reject the mm -hmm. frivolous or what we see as frivolous as unimportant. So how do we move to making self-care important and how can we tell when we're not just being selfish or lazy because we're making time for self-care? Yeah, I think that that's such an important question. And then you're right, it is something that all of my patients struggle with. Um, you know, I, I have a, a colleague who's a psychologist and, you know, she talks about shooting yourself to death. And um, I, I tell patients all the time, there is no mom police or dad police who's walking around with a clipboard saying, well, you should be doing this and you should be doing that and you could be doing this. Um, and if they are, you really should take the clipboard and kind of smack them on the head with it. Um, we do tend to beat ourselves up constantly and it doesn't really create any lessons that are important to learn from that. You know, I really like to look at, and, and psychology, you know, will, will tell you this, that 
you don't learn a lot from shame and guilt. Those are not emotions that you learn from. We learn from anger and lust and envy and grief. We, we learn from happiness and joy. We learn from failure. We, we, we learn from all these things. But the only thing we learn from that should be statement that, that, you know, that lack of self-care is actually shame. And when you learn to shame yourself, you don't learn anything productive from that. And self-care is the opposite of that. Deciding that you're going to engage in self-care, you know, is not a waste of time. And there's two analogies I tend to use with my patients. And I, and I think, you know, when you look at the Martian and you, know, you look at what Watney's talking about, he kind of really gets at this. Um, one is the important which he doesn't necessarily do, but I do with my patients, the importance of role modeling. Mm -hmm. If you decide you're going to take care of yourself, and Watney really kind of is a role model for this when he reunites with the team of NASA. Um, if you decide you're going to take care of yourself, you are showing anybody you're in contact with, whether it's somebody through a telecommunication device or somebody that you are living with, that this is important. And people are going to learn that they're going to do this in the future. If you get stuck on Mars in the future, self-care is really important, right? Two, and I think this is more important, that you value yourself. If you do not fill up your cup, you are not good to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, for people who are going into the medical profession, whether you're a CMA or a nursing student, or you're going to go on and become a physician or a nurse practitioner, there's an ICD-10 code. There's a billable code for caregiver fatigue, for caregiver stress. That's an actual code that I use with my patients. I entered it on a chart this morning for a patient I saw on Friday. And caregiver fatigue and stress is recognized by the American Medical Association. It's recognized by Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services that sets all of our building coding. It's saying, yes, this is a thing. And the reality of it is, if you don't put gas in your tank, your car does not run. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I will say to my patients, if I can't get you to do it for you, do it for your kids, do it for your students, do it for your employees. That's a great reason to do it. The real reason I want them to do it is I want them to value themselves enough to put that energy and time into themselves. They've got to fill their cup back up. And that's literally what I will say to them. What fills up your cup? You know, what, what gives you that fire? Wow. And, and I, what I find so interesting in The Martian is that Mark Watney does make time for this yes. um, he, because everyone brought along entertainment and he runs mm -hmm. out of place. So he starts um, reading Agatha Christie novels that saw another mm -hmm. crew member brought along. And he starts watching uh, bad 70s shows. I think it was the Dukes of Hazzard was one. Yeah, of yeah. yeah. right? Uh, like our childhood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's not just wasting time. That is no. him recharging and recuperating. Yes, absolutely. You have to recharge your batteries. My definition of self-care for my patients is anything that you are doing for the sole purpose of you taking care of you. There's no other motive, right? There's no other, oh, I'm gonna um, clean out my pantry and make it look pretty like they have it on Pinterest or Instagram and it's gonna look great and, and that's purposeful. No, the purpose is you taking care of yourself. <laughs> Excuse me, you can't have a secondary goal. You know, and I tell my patients, my two rules are, it has to be solely focused on yourself. And it's got to be legal and safe. Like, otherwise, I don't care. <laughs> like, that second really, one is like, important, too, yes. The second one's important, right? Um, I, and I really will say to patients, this is what you need to do for you. I, I just saw a patient Friday morning, and I, I told Dr. Thompson earlier today, I think I literally had this conversation six times Friday morning between 8 and noon. And I had a patient who's a pretty high-powered executive. Um, she used to commute about 45 minutes to an hour to work. And she's really struggling. She has been drinking four to five glasses of wine a night for coping. And the glasses are kind of this big, which is kind of a lot when you actually look at what's acceptable alcohol use for a patient her age and her gender. And she's really struggling with finding herself again and finding what she needs for her. And I said, well, what is it that you need? What's your barrier? What is your barrier to being healthy? And her response to me was, well, I need my commute back. And I don't think mm -hmm. she really understood that that's what it was until she said it out loud. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, I had this long commute and I took this job on purpose because I knew I needed that time to calm down before I got home. She needed the physical distance mm -hmm. to kind of like shed that outer, outer layer of who she was at work before she came home to deal with her, her teenage daughter and her husband and the dog and the cat and the chores. And I looked at her and I said, well, what do you do now? Because she's now permanently working at home. And she goes down the hall 
and puts a little laundry in and starts dinner. I said, well, you just got your, your commute back. And she looked at me like I had three heads. She looked at me like I was a Martian, right? She said, what do you mean? And I said, no, you're going to put it on your calendar that every day between five and six, this is what your commute is. And you're unavailable. Mm-hmm. And I said, I don't care what you do. I don't care if you color, do jumping jacks, go for a walk, take a bath. I literally don't care as long as it's legal and safe. And we made, I made a contract with her, a social contract that she's going to come back in a month and show me what she's done. She's gonna show me her calendar and say, this is what I've done, Dr. B. And I'm gonna contract with you that I'm going to, I'm only gonna drink one glass of wine a night. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna try not to drink on the weekdays at the end of that month. It's crucial, especially now that so we do these things. If you're a college student, and even when it's not a global pandemic yep. and you've got yep. a job and maybe you have kids or you have pets and yep. you've got schoolwork, it's really crucial to build in that time for self care. Okay. Absolutely. I, I could not agree with that statement more. And it feels overwhelming. It's great to hear a professor or a physician mm-hmm. or your mom or your husband say to you, well, why don't you just take care of yourself? And why don't you do this? And I can see the eyes rolling into the back of your head, right? Like in your best, like really, you know, it, it, your best Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man, Tony Stark eye roll, right? It's, I can <laughs> see it all happening. Um and this is no joke. Uh, I could not tell you how important this is for you guys taking care of yourself. Start with 15 minutes. Um, in a perfect world, I'd tell you to take a half an hour or an hour. And I can hear people pushing back at me saying, I don't have that time. Mm-hmm. I don't have a half an hour to an hour. Okay. That just popped up in my head. So yes, that's it. Yeah. I'm sure you're like, nope, I don't have nope. that. All right. Well, do you think you have 15 minutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Do you think you have five? Mm-hmm. Or do you think you have five minutes? Yep. Like how long does it take to pop a bag of popcorn in the microwave, right? Um, start with a small increment and start building that in. Start with something small and then work towards an attainable goal. Um, all the data out there, all the literature out there, even if you talk to efficiency experts, even if you're like, oh, this is just a doctor saying this. When you look at people who are efficiency experts, people who get paid a bazillion dollars to come to your company and talk to you about how to create a better work environment, um, we did a department training about two years ago by Dave Crenshaw, who's a pretty well-known author and business efficiency expert who writes the myth of multitasking, talking about the difference between using a to-do list and a calendar. And I went into this thinking, like, I multitask like a boss, right? <laughs> I was like, I, I can do this. And I came out of it thought, like, oh, my God, like, there's a lot I really need to learn. Having a calendar that I put an appointment on my calendar, and I have a shared calendar with my husband and my kid that says, this is what I'm doing this time at this day, is so meaningful because you're so much more likely to keep it. We are automated machines. We have an appointment. We have a reminder. We're going to feel shameful if we don't do it. Interesting. Use that for success. I like that. So is that your, is, is that kind of the takeaway from all of yeah. this as we wrap up this um, discussion that we're having today? We've got all these people with all of this stuff on their plate. We've now thrown in a global pandemic on top of what's so difficult about the first two years of college. I can't um, imagine. It's yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's a little rough. Um, and may, you know, we are up in Sussex County. Not everybody has the best access to technology as you were speaking yep. about earlier. So what is the most important thing we take away from this talk and from reading The Martian in your view? I'm, I'm going to give you two that are kind of one. One, and, and, and there's a reason for it, I promise. Um, one is that um, self-care, you're worth your own time. I can't tell you enough. If you don't value yourself, nobody else is going to. Um, you have to value yourself. You've got to fill your cup back up. You've got to put gas in that tank or the car will not run. It, that's just basic. Everybody understands that. You try to turn the car on, there's no gas, you're going nowhere. Especially um, now that it, we're in the third semester of this and we thought yeah. it was going to be maybe the end of last spring yeah. semester. Yeah. You know, we're not going anywhere until like, I don't know, July, September, maybe if we're fingers crossed, we're there. Um, you know, and, and I think that that's truly crucial. The second part of this, and this is kind of the caveat that goes with number one, is that this is going to feel uncomfortable. Mm. This is going to feel bad. This is going to feel like you're, you're, I hope you come out of this talk and you're invigorated and you're like, yes, I'm going to read the Martian again. And I'm going to think about how important self-care is and what I'm going to do to myself. 
and you're going to make that appointment on your calendar, right? That's your homework. We're in education. We give patients homework every day. I tell them, here's your homework. You have to do this. Um, Dr. Thompson does homework. She does assignments. Looks on Canvas. It's there. It's in the syllabus. In case you're wondering where it is, it's in the syllabus, right? Um, You're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to have a moment where you feel like this is wrong and this is bad. And it's not. We, again, that phrase creatures of habit is there for a reason. Any good psychologist, any good physician is going to tell you we reproduce patterns of behavior that are familiar and healthy. We're going to keep doing that until the way we keep doing those things, change has to be less painful and less uncomfortable than the status quo you're living in. Mm. Change only happens when the process, the uncomfortableness, the anxiety, the I don't feel good about this moment of change is less scary than where you're at right now. And lean into that. Go home and watch Beauty and the Beast. It is one of my favorite, absolute favorite Disney movies. I give this homework to my patients. I know Dr. Thompson loves it. I love it. We've seen it on Broadway. It's great. Uh, We both love Belle. Lots of books. We love it. Um, The big message for Beauty and the Beast is that you don't want to judge a book by its cover, right? That's the message for children. And it's, it's an important message for adults too. The actual message of Beauty and the Beast comes in the end when Gaston gets the magic mirror and Belle is saying, no, no, the beast is wonderful and he's kind and he's her friend. And Gaston looks at him and he can't understand how somebody who has fangs and hair and claws and teeth is actually really kind. And he leads this lynch mob of the townspeople with torches and pitchforks and they're stomping to the castle. And they say, we don't know and we don't like things we don't understand. And in fact, it scares us. Mm-hmm. And it is the most riveting fast moment in that film you've got to go back and watch it like three times to understand well that's why I'm not taking care of myself because I'm not used to it I I'm not taking that 15 minute walk I'm not taking that five minute break to practice mindfulness which Watney practices right where I'm just going to sit in my chair and pay attention to my feet are on the floor and my back I, I feel my back against this chair and this is how my breathing feels that's what mindfulness is you're not being present. You're not thinking about solution-based thinking. You're just overwhelmed by the problem. We can't engage in self-care if it's so foreign and so uncomfortable to us that we run away from it because it feels bad. The flip side of that is true. The more you do it, the easier it actually is, less scary that it is. It's not any different than riding a bike or learning how to make mac and cheese. That is fantastic. And I, it, I'm always amazed and I'm always humbled by um, how much we can take away from fiction. And right yeah. now, I'm just so grateful that you've taken the time to join us and to give us this fresh perspective that isn't necessarily something that I would have thought of on my own. So I love bringing all these different disciplines together to talk about fiction. Right. So I'm thank so excited you so to much be here. for taking the time. And I really look forward to hopefully welcome you, welcoming you to our campus in person at some point <laughs> in the not too distant future when we can get off Mars and go back to Earth again. I couldn't agree more. And thank you so much for this opportunity. It's always helpful for me to revisit fiction, whether it's popular fiction or cult fiction. It's important for me to think about different ways to teach my patients and my learners lessons. I'm always looking for new ways to present important ideas. This is something I do every day with my residents. Um, We are incorporating, for anybody who's interested, we are actually incorporating a narrative medicine curriculum into our residency didactics. Narrative medicine is a practice where we use reading and fiction and art and literature to teach different concepts of both self-care and um, actually physician-patient communication. So literature, fiction continues to be an important part of every aspect of your life, you know, not just courses that you have to check off on your box in your community college. They're really important for you no matter what field you go in. So thank you for the opportunity. And I'm really excited to be able to visit you guys hopefully soon, you know, on campus in person. And thank you for that. And to any of our students who are considering where you might want to transfer, you know, start here, go to Rowan University, whether for medicine 
or any other subject. Uh, now, just a final note to any students, if you do still need your copy of The Martian, um, the Sussex County Community College Library has some, just call the librarians and they'll be happy to assist you with our library takeout system. So Dr. Vermeulen, you'll be happy to hear that um, you know we're maintaining all COVID protocols in the distribution of our college novels. Excellent, right. COVID friendly is good. Exactly, all right. So thank you all for listening. Again, thank you Dr. Vermeulen for joining us and I hope everyone has a safe and healthy semester. My pleasure, stay safe everyone. Thank you.